So we're at that point in the Gospel of St. Luke as we're moving through chapter 11 where he's taking the Pharisees to task pretty strongly. Woe to you, woe to you. I think we have three woes today. And then the scribes, like dummies, so you're insulting us too. Got one for you guys too, <laughs> right? And the Lord puts the scribes in their place because they impose burdens but don't help anybody. And the Lord's attacking the Pharisees because of their pride, because of their judgmentalism. They refuse to accept him as the Messiah, and it's their pride that's blocking it. But today he seems to be attacking their selfishness and self-centeredness. And our Lord really hits home here when he says, You pay tithes of mint and of rue and of every garden herb. Nothing wrong with paying tithes on those things. But, the Lord says, you pay no attention to judgment and to the love for God. In other words, you're paying all these tithes, but you're not even considering your own personal judgment before God and how God judges things, nor are you paying attention to, to love. You're not taking, paying attention to the care of other people. And this the Lord could possibly say to us sometimes when we get so caught up in ourselves, we get so wonder, uh, caring about our own problems that we forget about the needs of others. I pulled out today the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I just turned to uh, paragraph 2447, because I think it's important for us to consider the fact that there is a reality in our culture, in our time, where there are people around us who are living less than Christian lives. If we were to go back to that letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, the first reading, and we hear the things that are the works of the flesh, uh, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drunken bouts, orgies, and the like, we could say that pretty much defines our present day culture, <laughs> right? You read that list, you're like, yeah, turn on any television station, that's what you're going to see. Any news station, that's what's going to go on. Take a walk outside and that's what you're going to see. This is the reality of our situation. So are we being judgmental by seeing it, recognizing it, and calling it for what it is? No. St. Paul obviously is doing that. It's not judgmental to recognize sin as sin or to recognize somebody as living a sinful life. And we should respond to it, not with anger or rage or condemnation in a sense that it's looking down on others in a pride of, ha, 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 you're going to hell and I'm not, right? That's the inappropriate way to respond to this, right? We should never laugh or mock someone who might be on the road to perdition. If anything, we now have a responsibility to actually reach out the hand to that person who is on that road. Yes, we need to be removing the plank from our own eye at all times. That plank from our eyes is very long, and it's going to take us a lifetime to get it out of our eye. But our Lord doesn't tell us not to remove the speck out of the other's eye, but he tells us to get the plank out of our own first, right? So if we're in the process of getting the plank out of our eye, then it's okay for us to begin to assist others in getting the speck out of theirs. And so there are, in fact, things we need to be doing. Particularly in our culture today, we need to be responding with the spiritual works of mercy. The spiritual works of mercy. We don't often hear about the spiritual works of mercy anymore. Everyone always talks about the corporal works of mercy because we live in the age of social justice, all the social justice warriors who want to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, which is wonderful, good things, right? These are things we should be doing also in caring for the poor and the needy, but we also can't forget the importance of the spiritual works of mercy as well. Definitely we should be doing the corporate works of mercy, of feeding the poor, visiting the sick, visiting the dying, uh, visiting the imprisoned, we should be giving drink to the thirsty, shelter to the homeless. Those are things we should be doing. Those are the corporal works of mercy. But there are also the spiritual works of mercy, which are just as, and perhaps even more important. Because someone, if they do not know the faith, and are locked in lives of sin, and never receive instruction or correction, their very souls could go to hell if someone is not there to lead them to the path of life. 
Let me go over these real quick. What are some of the, what are the seven spiritual works of mercy? Instructing the ignorant. Now, ignorant would not mean that in the sense of an insulting word. Ignorant means without knowledge. Instructing those who don't know. We should be instructing others in the faith. Now, we ourselves need to learn our faith, and thanks be to God here in the parish. You have a beautiful every Thursday class on scripture and so forth, and you're learning the faith more and more. You probably know your faith better than most. Uh, but you need to take that gift of faith that's been given to you and assist others in learning the faith whether that's teaching in RCIA or teaching the little ones or it's instructing friends or family on the true teachings of the faith. If they accept it or not, it's up to them. That's not up to you. You have to present it. You can lead the horse to water. It's up to them to drink it or not. But we need to be providing the waters of truth to those around us. And here we have advising, right? To advise those who are lost, to give good counsel. And not just simply advice in relationships or something like this, but the advice on how to move away from sin, the advice of how to live a life of virtue. Now, we should be receiving that advice and studying how to actually grow so that we can pass that on to others, but we should be assisting others and advising those on how to walk in the path of the Lord. Consoling, consoling the sorrowful. That's something we should be very attentive to. We have a world filled of sorrow. What's a beautiful way of doing this? Sometimes it's visiting a nursing home, sitting with somebody who's all alone, and they're sorrowing because their family doesn't come to visit them anymore, and to console them in their sorrow. Or someone we know who has lost somebody who they've loved, or they're struggling from some type of difficulty in their lives, to be able to console them, to be present to them, primarily to console them with the love of God. Even praying for them could be a way of consoling them. Comforting is another, right? Comforting. We need to comfort souls uh, who are in, in difficulty and struggle. Uh, we also have forgiving. Well, that's a tough one, right? Forgiving others, but that's a spiritual work of mercy. How many people are bearing, perhaps, in their soul this, this guilt or shame, what they did to us, and we've never forgiven them, so they never really get free of that. And they feel bound because we never told them that we do forgive them. Right? Forgivingness is a very hard thing to do, but forgiving doesn't justify what they've done, but it does allow us the freedom to no longer hold this against them. And we know we've forgiven if we can pray for them, and uh, if we're able to um, unite it to the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to change the pain into compassion for them, and the memory of it into praying for them into session. And then bearing wrongs patiently. That's a tough spiritual work of mercy, right? So many people wrong us, right? So many things wrong us in life. But if you can bear that patiently, like our Lord did, that is a spiritual work of mercy. Um, and I also want to just consider also praying for the dead, and that's important of that as well. So, you know, we talk about these uh, uh, things that we need to be doing. It's not just a matter of the physical or the corporal works, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, giving home shelter to the homeless, and so forth. It's also the spiritual works. And I particularly want to focus on those first two of uh, instructing the ignorant and advising the doubtful. So be able to advise a person who is doubtful to the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. To advise somebody how to live a good and holy life. Again, whether they accept it or not, that's not up to us. But we need to be at least giving them that bit of light. They may very well accept it. They may very well. Will you get a little backlash with speaking the truth? Yeah, you will. You will. But to stand in the truth with love is incredibly important. And that's, I guess, part of the key here when our Lord says about uh, not to neglect love, right? So you go out and you present the truth to somebody. Don't force it down their throats. Right? And don't water it down either. If you're giving your child medicine and the medicine doesn't taste good, you try to force it down their throat, they're going to vomit it back up or run from you. If you mix it with too much water, you're going to water it down and it's going to be unusable. Right? It won't lose its potency. You can't dilute it. You have to kind of mix it with applesauce. Right? Every good parent knows you mix it with something like applesauce and the medicine goes down a lot easier. What's the old song? A spoonful of sugar makes that medicine go down, right? 
So we have to be able to present the truths of the faith, which are very hard for this culture to accept, the fullness of the truth, in a way that the culture can understand it, in a way this person we're speaking to can understand it. So we're not forcing it down their throat, saying, you have to believe this or else. They'll go, get out of my face, leave me alone. Right? Or if you water it down, going, it's okay, Jesus frowns on that, but you know, do what you want. That's not good either. That's watering it down. We need to present the truth in a way that they can go, huh, that's beautiful. That's good. I want that. So we really need to pray to the Holy Spirit before we speak to somebody, whether we're advising or instructing, to do so in such a way that we're going to be able to present the fullness of the beauty of the truth in such a way they go, I want that. Where they recognize their thirst. They recognize their hunger for the truth. They recognize the light. They desire the light. And they want to be in that light. So we don't water it down. We don't shove it down people's throats. We present the faith in such a way they go, hmm, that's really beautiful. And so we have to think of various examples and ways in which we can explain it, but really it's the prayer to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows how they're going to accept it. So we need to really pray for the Holy Spirit to give us that wisdom and that knowledge and that understanding in order to present the gospel most prudently to those who are so in need of it. Our culture is so in need of the gospel. It is so in need of advisement of the Holy Spirit to lead it, to guide it. So we pray this day, particularly that each of us be given that gift of the Holy Spirit, that to those people we are sent, to those who come into our lives, where we need to instruct and we need to advise, that the Holy Spirit will give us the wisdom, the understanding, and the knowledge, and the counsel necessary to prudently and with with fortitude, present the beauty of our faith in such a way that the persons who are so in need will turn to the Lord and live lives of true holiness and experience the joy of knowing Christ Jesus. May God bless you and Mary keep you.